All right, hello everyone. Um, all right, so we're about to begin our second session that encounters with Bergson evaluations and analysis. We'll be, we will be exploring um, Bergson's relation to uh, contemporaries of his, uh, particularly in the English speaking world. Um, what we'll do is we have two speakers and we, they will do exactly as we just uh, did in the last panel. One will speak, then the other. Um, and then we'll have about half an hour roughly for Q and A where you can ask both of them questions. So our first speaker uh, for this session then is Joël Dolbeau. Uh, Joël studied uh, the history of philosophy and the philosophy of science at the University of Paris-Sorbonne. He then obtained his PhD at the University of Lille under Frederick Worms as his uh, thesis director. His research aims to confront the main metaphysical ideas of Bergson uh, with contemporary ideas in philosophy and science. He's particularly interested in the Bergsonian theory of matter and has published several articles on this subject in both French and English. The title of Joel's talk today is Panpsychism in Bergson and James. Welcome, Joel. Hello, thank you, Ted, for this presentation. And thank you uh, to the organizers of the webinar. I need a PowerPoint, so I click on uh, Écran Partagé. Okay. That should be fine, yeah. Uh, you see my screen? Uh, uh, we see a Penn State screen. Oh, now it's coming up, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Now you see uh, the title of my presentation, I suppose. Okay. So uh, my presentation is about uh, Pampsychism in Bergson and uh, James. Uh, I start right away uh, by explaining what I mean by Pampsychism, uh, referring to uh, the, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, Pampsychism is the view, uh, it's a, a short definition, of course, Psychism is the view that uh, mentality is fundamental and uh, ubiquitous in the natural world. Uh, so for Psychism, uh, mentality is a character of all living beings, but also uh, of a not matter. Note that uh, for almost all Psychist thinkers today, uh, mentality is not a character of uh, stones or of um, mountains, rivers, etc., but uh, a character of elementary particles of matter or uh, the universe as a whole. It is uh, the, the two possibilities. Uh, in this presentation, I will attempt to show that Bergson and James defend a form of panpsychism and that on this point, uh, Bergson probably had an influence on James. Um, Bergson uh, supports panpsychist ideas without using the word panpsychism. Uh, whereas James uses this word uh, to characterize his own ideas, but also those of Bergson. I will come back to it. Uh, in this introduction, I also want to say a few words about uh, what is at stake first in the panpsychism of Bergson and James. Uh, what is at stake is not uh, the question of the existence of the physical world. Uh, for Bergson and James, uh, a physical world exists independently of the mind. So uh, their panpsychism is not a kind of idealism. Uh, what is at stake is not uh, first is not the question of the exit of the, uh, the the question of the origin of uh, consciousness either uh, that is uh, the idea that the mental properties of matter would be at the origin of consciousness in fact bergson is opposed to this idea james is not totally opposed to this idea but he does not develop his panpsychist hypothesis uh, on this question, on the basis of this question. Uh, so this is uh, uh, an important difference from uh, contemporary panpsychism. What is at stake uh, first uh, in uh, Bergson's and James' panpsychism is the question of causation in the physical world. Um, the question is, can we understood uh, causation in the physical world without introducing the idea that matter has mental properties. 
for Bruxon and James, the answer is negative. Uh, we must introduce mental properties to understand all causation. Uh, in my opinion, sorry, in my opinion, uh, this question is important because it probably concerns a weak point of physicalism, uh, which is the dominant view in philosophy today. Many thinkers consider that, consider that physicalism fails to provide a, a satisfactory theory of consciousness, uh, but maybe it also fails to provide a satisfactory theory of causation. And this is what is at stake uh, first uh, in uh, the, pam the pam psychism supported by uh, Bergson and James. The plan of my presentation is very simple. Uh, first part uh, on Bergson's panpsychism and second part on uh, James's panpsychism. First part, uh, in uh, most of his books, uh, we find passages uh, where Bergson asserts that uh, matter has a kind of memory, a kind of consciousness. Uh, Bergson's panpsychist approach uh, is therefore obvious. Uh, however, to fully understand these passages, uh, we must uh, ask the following question. What kind uh, of uh, memory of consciousness is Bergson talking about? Uh, it seems that uh, the answer is twofold. On the one hand, uh, in many passages, uh, Bergson asserts that matter has a memory of its immediate past. I quote uh, two passages uh, showing this, but there are many more. Uh, one passage in uh, duration and simultaneity. Once again, it is impossible to imagine or conceive a connecting link between the before and after without an element of memory and, consequently, of consciousness. Duration, therefore, implies consciousness and we place consciousness at the earth of things for the very reason that we credit them with a time that endures. A second passage is in uh, Life and Consciousness, uh, uh, written in 1911 and republished in uh, Mind Energy. On the one hand, there is matter subject to necessity, devoid of memory or at least with no more than suffices to form the bridge between two of its moments, each of which can be deduced from its antecedent, each of which adds nothing to what the world already contains. On the other hand, there is consciousness, memory with freedom, continuity of creation in a duration in which there is real growth. Uh, this uh, passage uh, is uh, particularly enlightening uh, because it showed that uh, for Bergson, memory of the immediate past uh, is not memory with freedom. That is, uh, memory par excellence, uh, to use uh, an expression uh, of maternal memory. Memory of the immediate past is only a retention of the immediate past that is a kind of sensory retention. Rory's memory par excellence is an ability to retrieve what has become unconscious. Uh, according to Bergson, matter does not have this ability, which is uh, consciousness in the narrow sense of the term. Therefore, matter does not have the same consciousness as us, more generally as uh, living beings. On the other hand, uh, in uh, some other passages, Bergson has said that uh, matter has a kind of motor memory, that is, uh, a memory of automatisms. The clearest passage is in uh, matter memory. Uh, it is uh, the, the end of chapter four. We may go further. Uh, memory does not intervene as a function of which matter has no presentiment and which it does not imitate in its own way. 
Thus, to use again a metaphor which has more than once appeared in this book, it is necessary and for similar reasons that the past should be acted by matter, imagined by mind. Uh, in this passage, uh, Bergson clearly alludes uh, to the distinction between uh, habit memory and memory par excellence, the distinction of the chapter two of the book. Uh, he therefore asserts that uh, matter has a motor memory analogous to our habit memory. This memory allows matter to act regularly. But in the same time, Bergson asserts once again that matter has not memory par excellence. Uh, in living beings, a motor reaction is triggered by a perception. Therefore, if matter has a motor memory, it must also have a perceptual capacity. And, and Bergson also asserts this in some passage of matter and memory, chapter one, uh, essentially. First passage, in one sense, we might say that the perception of any unconscious material point, whatever, in its in instantaneousness, is infinitely greater and more complete than ours, since this point gathers and transmits the influence of all the points of the material universe, whereas our consciousness only attains to certain parts and to certain aspects of those parts. And uh, further on, to perceive all the influences from all the points of all bodies would be to descend to the condition of a material object. According to Bergson, uh, the perception of a material, object, material point, a uh, material particle, uh, is non-selective, while our perception is selective due to our biological uh, specificities. But the most important point here is that uh, the perception of a material point immediately triggers an action. Unlike what happens uh, with us, it cannot trigger the retrieval of past representations. To sum up, uh, for Bergson, matter has two kinds of memory. A memory of the immediate past, which is an ability to retain what has been just perceived, a sensory uh, retention, and a motor memory, which is an ability to immediately react to what has been just perceived. But unlike living beings, unlike us in particular, matter has no memory, no memory par excellence. Uh, so it cannot imagine, it cannot create. It does not have a consciousness in the narrow sense of the term. Uh, only what uh, Bergson calls a neutralized consciousness. This uh, expression uh, is uh, used by Bergson several times at the end of matter and memory to characterize matter. I turn now to uh, the arguments that Bergson puts forward to support his panpsychist hypothesis. Uh, in his books, we find uh, two arguments. Argument one for uh, the idea that matter has a memory of its immediate past. Uh, the almost complete uh, formulation of this argument uh, can be found in Duration and Simultaneity, uh, chapter three. Uh, one, the physical world is continually changing. Two, we are able to conceive of this change. It's a presupposition. Three, the only change that we can concretely conceive implies the memory of the immediate past. This point must be explained. This explanation is in Bergson. To conceive the change between two states A and B equals to conceive a continuous process between A and B equals to conceive the unity of the past and the present of this process equals to conceive that the present of this process is endowed with the memory of its past. Conclusion, the physical world has a memory of its immediate past. Uh, the presupposition point two 
echoes the Bergsonian idea that uh, knowledge is not relative, uh, that it can reach the reality of things and not only their uh, appearance. Uh, for this point, uh, see for, for, for more to this point, see in particular the introduction of uh, creative uh, mind, creative mind. Point three is finally the typically Bergsonian idea that the continuity of duration cannot can only be understood as the conservation of the past in the present. I turn now to the second argument for the idea that matter has a kind of motor memory. Uh, one, the behavior of inert matter is automatic in the sense that each of its parts reacts to the presence of the others in an immediate and typical way. Two, the behavior of living beings can also be automatic. In fact, uh, living beings are, have a lot of automatic uh, behaviors. In the case of living beings, Automatic behaviors are caused by a motor memory whose actions are triggered by perceptions. Consequently, by analogy, one can assume that the behavior of inert matter is also caused by a kind of motor memory whose actions are triggered by perceptions. Two remarks on this uh, argument. First, the second argument seems more solid than the first, the first one because it is based on three empirically uh, obvious premises. Of course, uh, point four is speculative uh, because it is based on an analogy, uh, but reasoning by analogy is not shocking. Uh, it is very common in human knowledge, in particular, including in science. My second remark uh, is that uh, the explanation of the existence of physical uh, regularities remain, remains an open question uh, in philosophy today. Uh, physicalism uh, seems uh, to have uh, no answer to this question. For physicalism, regularities are a brute fact. Moreover, uh, the most classical answer to this question is a kind of Platonism adapted to modern science. Uh, it is the idea that uh, the physical world presents regularities because it obeys laws of nature. As for Plato, uh, the physical world presents regularities because it obeys ideas. On this question, I therefore uh, think that the Bergsonian hypothesis uh, that matter has a kind of, me of a motor memory explaining the physical regularities is uh, relevant uh, in the contemporary debate. The same hypothesis was also developed by Peirce independently at the same time. Uh, in particular, in these two articles, uh, The Architecture of Theories and uh, Man's Glassy Essence. I come now to my second part, uh, James's Panpsychism. Um, between 1905 and uh, 1909, the year of his death, uh, James developed a panpsychist conception of nature. Uh, in addition, on, on several occasions, he mentions Bergson as a source of inspiration. I quote uh, two passages showing this. Uh, the first passage is in uh, the writing, The Experience of Activity, written in 1905 and republished in, uh, in the Parastic Universe. Um, if uh, there be real creative activities in being, radical empiricism must say somewhere, they must be immediately lived. Somewhere, the that of efficacious casing and the what of it must be experienced in one, just as the what and the that of cold are experienced in one whenever a man has the sensation of cold here and now. And further on, uh, James uh, writes, uh, the problems of activity lead, however, into that region of panpsychic and ontologic speculation of which uh, professors Bergson and Strong 
have lately enlarged the literature in so able and interesting a way. And the second passage uh, is in uh, some problems of philosophy. Uh, it is the end of the, 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 this book, in fact. Meanwhile, uh, the concrete perceptual flux uh, taken just as it comes offers in our own uh, activity situations perfectly comprehensible instances of causal agency. Uh, if we took these experiences as the type of what actual causation is, we should have to ascribe to cases of causation outside of our own uh, life, to physical cases also, an inwardly experiential nature. In other words, uh, we should have to espouse a so-called panpsychic philosophy. And as a note to this text, uh, James mentions Bergson as one of the thinkers, uh, quotation, whose discussion most resembles my own. As we can see, uh, these two passages and others uh, focus on the question of activity. Uh, the question of agency to uh, use a more contemporary term. According to James, uh, the experience of our own uh, psychophysical activity could be the basis for thinking any causation in the world. In this sense, any being, including physical reality, would have, uh, I quote James, an inwardly experiential nature. James himself uh, writes that this hypothesis is panpsychist. This is the word he, he, he uses. And he asserts that a similar hypothesis can be found in Bergson without, however, uh, indicating, indicating a, a precise book. Uh, James does not pretend that his panpsychist hypothesis is perfectly grounded. Uh, he just says, it just says that uh, it is relevant and uh, must be developed in more detail. In his writings of 1905 and 1909, he developed an argument to support it. Uh, this argument can be presented as follows. Um, it, it, the same argument uh, appear in, in, in his two texts, uh, 1905 and 1909. Uh, one, physical things have causal powers. We are able to conceive of these causal powers. The only causal powers that we can concretely conceive are mental, explanation, uh, which is in gems. Any clear idea of cause is the idea of a present fact A, which in a way or another contains a future fact B. But only one experience corresponds to this, to, this, to this idea, the experience of anticipation. In this case, a mental fact A contains in a representation a fact B uh, to be produced. In conclusion, uh, the causal powers of physical things are mental. We see that this argument has exactly the same form as uh, Bergson's argument one. In premise two, we find a presupposition about our ability to know nature. In premise uh, three, we find the idea that uh, something cannot be conceived other than as having a mental character. Uh, here, the requirement is to find something given in experience and not to build an abstract idea. Uh, this is the, the radical empiricism of James. Regarding this premise uh, three, uh, a similar analysis of the idea of cause can be found at the end of time and free will. L'essai sur les données immédiates de la conscience. It is the end of chapter three. So uh, this analysis could be the main Bergsonian source of James, James's panpsychism. Uh, the difference between uh, Bergson's argument one and James's argument is that Bergson's argument one is about change, whereas James's argument is about causation. 
Uh, and in the, the notion of causation, uh, you have the idea of change, but also the idea of producing something. This is why in his argument, uh, James focuses on the, on the notion of anticipation and not on that of memory like in uh, Bergson's argument one. For Bergson, if matter has motor memory, it also anticipates the future, but only the immediate future and only unconsciously. Because for Bergson, an automatism is an unconscious representation of the type if A, then B. For James, it seems that there are two possibilities. Either matter has only a kind of motor memory, and this is the Bergson and you, or matter is already living. That is, it, have, uh, it can have intentions. Uh, in a pluralistic universe, uh, his last uh, published book, uh, James evokes this hypothesis uh, by referring to the German uh, psychologist and philosopher, uh, Gustav Fechner. Conclusion. Just uh, three brief uh, remarks. Uh, Bergson and James uh, both developed a panpsychist hypothesis about causation in the physical world. Uh, on this question, Bergson had an influence on James. And uh, this panpsychist hypothesis is one way of explaining physical regularities. In contrast, physicalism has no explanation. Uh, it therefore constitutes an incomplete uh, theory of uh, nature. Thanks for your attention. Uh, and here are two articles to know more uh, about uh, Bergson's panpsychism and uh, James's panpsychism. Thank you. And thank you very much, Joe. Um, all right, so before we have, we. Um, do questions for Joe, we're gonna to proceed to our next speaker and then we'll do both of the questions together. Um, our next speaker then is Mohit Abro. Uh, Mohit is a doctoral candidate uh, in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Uh, his PhD thesis is focused on Henri Bergson's influence on the modernist poet T.S. Eliot. Following Bergson's notion of lived duration, his research aims to present Eliot as a philosopher poet whose works revealed the contradictions of the modernist age. His other research interests include the postmodern condition, the rise of fascism and the Cold War era, continental philosophy, Marxist studies, political violence, and the idea of justice. Mohit is also an assistant professor uh, in the Department of English, uh, Gragi College um, at the University of Delhi. Uh, currently, he is working on a, a book project, which is based on a philosophical inquiry into the concept of disciplinarity and how it needs to be redefined in the contemporary digital age. The title of Mohit's talk is Bergson Eliot uh, Encounters, Philosophical Notes on Time, Theology, and Culture. Welcome, Mohit. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we're all set. So, uh, great. So, I need to share my screen. So, just one second. Yeah. Yes, is it visible to everyone? All right, so uh, I would like to thank Professor Len for giving me this opportunity to present my paper over here on this platform and be part of globalist, Global Works Onism project. Um, and it's really heartening to see so many works on scholars, uh, so many people who are interested in his philosophy. It's really nice to see something good happening, <laughs> even in the times of pandemic. So that's one thing. And uh, I'm joining from Delhi, and this is the topic that I'm going to present my paper on. So it's basically books on Eliot encounters, uh, certain philosophical notes on time, theology, and culture. So uh, my paper begins by rejecting the premise in the existing ex uh, Eliot scholarship that there exists a fundamental divide in perceiving Eliot as a philosopher from Eliot as a poet. I'm going to move beyond this divide. I'm going to see him as one. He is a philosopher poet. So I'm going to propose Eliot the philosopher and his philosophical questions uh, are extremely important for our times. And those questions are in some ways connected 
very strongly with Bergson's inquiry about notions of time, reality, and uh, consciousness. So that's the basic aim of my presentation. So I'm going to begin with that now. Okay, so does time exist? What is the nature of time? Because the first and most uh, fundamental thing about Bergson is, although he has dealt with many topics, but one of the most important question uh, is about time, how time really makes us aware of the world that we live in. So that's the first inquiry that I'm going to turn my gaze on. Can we turn time from a mere accident of reality into the very substance of life and being? Since many philosophers, both ancient and modern, embraced the concept of time and interpreted it in their own ways, it testifies to the fact that the notion of time refuses to die down. It's very much a lively concern for almost all of us. So in fact, his interpretation makes the notion of time of profoundly philosophical task. Okay, that is that we live in a lived duration, that idea of duration, that uh, semantic distinction, what is time and what is duration is extremely important. And T.S. Eliot on his part demonstrates all these ideas in his poetic as well as creative critical works. So that's the connection which I'm trying to look at. As Frederick Worms argues, it is as if Bergson's philosophy rediscovered from the outset, the most ancient task of philosophy, which is not to distinguish between concepts, but between ways of thinking or ways of conducting oneself. So basically, Bergson's philosophy then has to be traced back from the times of pre-Socratic era. So that's what I'm going to discuss very soon. So why this philosophy is important, why we need a philosophy of time, because I will argue that this new philosophy of time, which is based on the affirmation of plurality, multiplicity, uh, and life can provide grounds for the emergence of something entirely new, perhaps a global way of thinking about this world, which is not exactly global as Professor Depeche and Professor Frederick Worms also argued, perhaps something which is at a planetary or even a cosmic level. So it is in their explorations uh, about time that the encounter between Bergson and Eliot becomes most engaging. So that's what I'm going to look at. So Bergson and Eliot's treatment of time, their views on coexistence, consciousness and creative force hold considerable relevance for our times. And that's why I'm going to pay much more attention to that. So over here. So first is basically philosophical articulation of time as people have tried to, as philosophers have tried to deal with it. Um, so the image of river that you can see the first picture suggests time as a flow and in a single direction. Hence the notion of arrow of time. But the river may well be thought of as the flow of motion through space as well. There are no eternally existent elemental parts. The entire process of the universe in change absolutely does not persist. So I'm basically drawing on the idea of Heraclitus. Each smallest particle as well as itself consumed by change and ceases to be. So this metaphysical concept of non-persistence, which is coming from Heraclitus, is both taken as a figuratively and literally in the form of fire. So he compares this idea to fire. Because as a theory of time, he says, he denies basically the ultimate reality of being. The universe burns away like a great fire over the long night. What exists solely is becoming. So that's the only uh, fact which exists for Heraclitus. There is no smallest uncuttable particle in space and likewise no ultimate atom of time. So far down or up as one may go in looking, there is only change, not being. There is ultimately no individual or collective. This is as true of cosmic time as it is true of the single moment. The basis of Heraclitus ontology is the notion that existence scatter and combine. And this is a principle which comes very strongly to Bergson also, because when he says that consciousness and duration are connected in the ways which even Deleuze tries to talk about in his book, Difference and Repetition, uh, in the form of virtual, which is in the process of actualization, how virtual is so different from real and possible. That kind of a connection, that kind of a schema that he draws over there in that work is basically an implication of duration, which Bergson tries to talk about in his first book, Time and Freedom. So this approach by Heraclitus is uh, refused or repudiated by Parmenides, who represented the Eleatic school. And he says, there is not, nor will there be anything other than what is, because destiny has fettered it to remain whole and immovable. 
So the unchanging being is never affected by time because it has neither a before nor an after, both of which are indissolubly linked with change and process. Now, Plato also works on this Parmenides idea, and but he uses the image, this river image, and makes this image of river as the image of eternity. So Demiurge in his book, Demias, you know, gives this idea, this mythical explanation of the creation of universe. So the main idea here is basically that cosmos cannot be eternal in the same sense that the realm of ideas are eternal, but it can mirror the idea of eternity through a cyclical periodical movement according to mathematical proportions. So for Plato, this movement, which can be mathematized in some ways is what we call time. Now, Plato discusses other modalities of time also, and that's why this reference to Doris Day's song, K Sera Sera, because Plato discusses this idea of what it was, what it is, and what is going to be, or what it will be. So that's the reference that I'm drawing over here. And he says that all these things, all these modalities can only be applied to the things which are there in this world, and not to the eternal realm of idea, or of which only the it is an appropriate formulation. So change, according to Plato, then becomes only an illusion. Now this, what we are seeing basically beginning with Heraclitus to Parmenides and then to Plato, and finally we reach to the point of Aristotle is the point of becoming that the first philosopher, the pre-Socratic philosopher is trying to talk about is totally dissolved by the time we reach the Aristotelian times. By the time we reach Aristotle, the question of time is something which is relegated to the nine accidents that he talks about in relation to the substance, which is usia. And that's the point which happens. So there's a reduction of becoming to now. So now becomes the most important part because it represents something which it is, which is which exists. And this idea of existence becomes very important. So it is composed of what is past and future, both of which are non-existent. The one being no more, the other not yet. So it does not exist as substantial, but only as an accidental being. So Aristotle, according to Aristotle's formulation, time then becomes mere accident of reality. As a result, uh, with this assertion, Aristotle once and for all closes the door on the philosophy of time. So it had to wait almost like there were, there must have been at least some philosophers who tried to resurrect that idea, but most substantially it emerges only with Bergson's philosophy. So Bergson had presented two uh, dissertations. One is basically time and free will, which has been translated also, but the other dissertation was in Latin, which was on Aristotle's idea of place. And over there, he discusses this idea very strongly, which is how time has been reduced to the accident of reality. So that's something that he discusses. Going to the next part. Now, these are two quotes that I've taken from Katrina Zonfi's uh, book which he has translated, Le Pons. This is The Creative Mind, which was written uh, roughly in 1930s by Bergson. It's one of the late books that he had written. So this book basically talks about, or his articulates a lot of things that he has to talk about, time and consciousness. So as you can read from the comments, but I'm going to read something which I have written over here. So I have discussed time before Bergson. Now this part of the presentation is time of Bergson. So what kind of uh, political and cultural milieu he was born in? And what are the things that he imbibed, which uh, you know created this kind of a radical outlook in him that the way time has been understood is something which is very problematic. And that's what this quote also refers to, the second one. So the third republic in France in 1889. 1889 is the period when he wrote Time and Free Will, when Bergson began to write. Before that, he, has, he had written a very short philosophy on poetry. That was the only work that he had done just before that. So Time and Free Will is the first book that he writes was projecting unbridled faith in experimental science because of the positivist trends which were existing at that point of time. The idea was that we need to wake up from the dogmatic slumbers, to use Kantian phrase, of the previous century and close as possible to the light of reason. In the same year when Nietzsche proclaimed God is dead, Ernst Renan, the French philosopher and historian, declared in his book, The Future of Science, this book incidentally also came out in 1889, that science has become the new religion. So science was elevated to that level, convinced by the scientific rigor of the age and historical importance given to intellect over intuition, which Bergson is going to reverse. Renault argued that genuine knowledge must now resemble scientific knowledge. Okay, so the kind of scaling which was mentioned by Professor Depeche and Professor uh, Frederick Worms is something which is happening around the times when Bergson started writing. 
that general knowledge has to be elevated to the level of scientific knowledge. So everything has to be proven empirically. So this mathematical complexity posited a block universe, which he mentions as terra firma in his works, where time and space were solely determined by geometrical coordinates in terms of quantitative entities, which are accessible to us like the position of the object. Okay, And uh, for Bergson, for Bergson's generation, actually, not just only for him, who, was, who were inspired by Henry Poincare, Edward Leroy, and Pierre Duhem, the most important question about science was to denounce this mathematical determinism and the static tendencies that it was trying to give rise to and see physical reality on the basis of flux or the notion of flux, which actually takes him back to this pre-Socratic philosophies of Heraclitus. You know, that's the point that I was trying to draw with the previous uh, slide. So this new understanding, a new orientation of, towards time and space, which uh, define the physical reality in many ways, encapsulate the philosophical revolt that Bergson would lead against the mechanistic determinism, which the older models of science advocated. Okay, so that's the next point. Now, what happens after Bergson's time, which is basically around 1920s, because he's suffering from severe bout of arthritis. So he takes a back seat, he stops teaching, and then he's assigned certain bureaucratic work. He's supposed to go to America to you know, discuss certain modalities of League of Nations and all of that. But during this period, there is one chance encounter that he has with uh, Einstein, because by now in 1922, Einstein has become a very big phenomenon. Both his theory of relativity and special theory of relativity had come out in 1905 and 1915. So over here, they meet in, on April 6 in 1922 in the Philosophical Society of Paris. And uh, uh, Bergson is really impressed with uh, Einstein's way of thinking because, he's think because he is of the view that Einstein is providing a new orientation to science. But then on this podium, on this platform, uh, the speakers were supposed to posit their ways of thinking about time. So first Bergson begins and provides his understanding of time, which is then refuted by Einstein. So Bergson's negotiation, negotiation with Einsteinian physics rested on the introduction of the distinction between real time and measured time. So this is a distinction that is initially introduced by Bergson in his earlier book, Time and Free Will. In this work, he writes the duration is essentially the continuation of what no longer exists into what exists. Okay, so that past that does not exist in the real sense but in the virtual capacity, in its virtual capacity, okay? So there is no way to separate two instance of, instance of the before and the immediate afterward and the memory that establishes their continuity of existence. So real time as such is only ever lived and perceived in the consciousness of its being lived. The point that was mentioned by Joel just now. So therefore, time reduced to the measurable phenomena, according to the philosopher, which is Bergson, will always fail to, uh, according to the philosopher, will always fail to fully grasp the temporality of time, the lived time that only always leaves, leaves or lives actually in the shadow as the source of objective time. Okay, so it is only the objective time which is captured, which is in some ways recognizable, but the shadow is something which is always missed out. So Bergson acknowledges that these kind of clocks are the sides of event and declares that the birth of modernism is an apotheosis of this theory of relativity. As such, Bergson designates the clocks to be as much as a concept of thought as an instrument of measurement. For what it calls for is a new conception of tempor uh, temporality coordinated by the electromagnetic signals. So modernism exists concurrently with this ordering of time or this new measurement of time. So though likewise the indivisibility of perception is itself conditioned by the temporal ordinate ordering of simultaneously, simultaneously uh, not related to physics, it is ignoring the lift time unifying the event what is going, given by the clock while only ever escaping the system of the sign. Okay, so that's the difference that he's creating over there. So after listening to Bergson, uh, Einstein articulates the essential conflict which he perceived with the, the explanation which was provided by Bergson. So he says, so the question before us is simply this, is the philosopher's time the same as the physicist, which is being, which is one of the major crux of uh, Jimena Canal's book, which came out in 2015. The answer that Einstein gives is a resounding no, because according to him, the philosopher can only conceive of time by the psychological reduction of objective events 
which for einstein must necessarily be independent of individual consciousness so in so doing the philosopher limits time to the temporality of mental constructions or logical beings so this is something that he found to be very inconsistent in bergson's understanding of time as a result there cannot be any such thing as a real philosopher's time so for einstein there is an unbridgeable chasm between the respective ground demanded by philosophy and the ground presupposed by physics most apparent upon their respectively thinking about time so what einstein failed to notice over here this is one of uh, the proposals or the suggestions which come from elizabeth gross uh, she says that bergson's theory demand a unique bridging act between philosophy and between scientific approaches which is physics so bergson provides an alternative mode of thinking a conjectural space where thinking about the future becomes possible something that the causal or the probabilistic modes of knowledge alone were incapable of so that's the assertion which is made over here but of course it was not really captured by einstein around that time now this is exactly the time when uh, bergson and eliot's encounter takes place this is the time just like 7 8 years before that because it is in 1910 that eliot uh, assumes that he should become a french poet because he thinks that uh, france is the place where poetry is and he goes there with all those aspirations but uh, and he starts attending all these lectures which were delivered by bergson and many of his contemporaries but very soon he becomes disillusioned by all these ideas and that's what is being suggested so a fabulous work has been done by nancy d hargov and william marx sorry the spelling is wrong william marx and uh, who have done a very proper archival research on the notebooks which collect the notes on bergson which were written by um, eliot during his stay in paris and uh, hotton library has just recently released uh, like 50 letters which were written uh, by eliot to his muse emily hale and emily hale had donated these letters to princeton uh, on this condition that these letters should be opened and read to the public only after 50 years of her as well as eliot's death so these letters were opened on january 12 this year itself so a lot of research scholars were able to go there but because of the pandemic situation uh, some of us were not able to uh, put uh, our perspective our understanding over there so uh, this was one of the plans that i also had but nonetheless it could not fructify now moving to the whole idea of bergson and eliot encounters eliot's connection with bergson emerges from his notebook lying in hotton library the notebook and the notes scribbled in french details the journey to paris that eliot undertook in the years 1912 10 to 11 basically just a matter of one and a half years listening to bergson's lecture in grand amphitheater at college de france eliot's poem just briefly just before his paris journey which is a uh, first debate between body and soul this is one of his early works portrait of a lady and the first half of love, love song of j alfred prufrock highlighted the schism that the poet felt between the body and the soul so initially around 1910 and 11 the ideas that uh, eliot was trying to grapple with was the dualism which has existed for too long and in some ways he thought that perhaps bergson would have an answer and uh, that kind of a dualism can be resolved into some kind of a monism but even then uh, he became disillusioned with bergson as the currents changed around bergson because of julian benda and uh, you know certain neo thomists who started uh, writing very vicious attacks on bergson in uh, action francaise one of the journals right wing journals on, uh, during those times now eliot voiced his objections against bergson so then bergson uh, then eliot disillusioned with bergson's philosophy comes back to harvard and he delivers a lecture in uh, the philosophical club because he was the president at that point of time and he questions the lack of scientific rigor and predominance of what he felt were emotional responses to lyric philosophies so by the time he reached uh, howard he compared bergson's philosophy to a lyric philosophy which is something which is extremely speculative and something which cannot be taken seriously which in some ways also reflects the mood of the era or the milieu in which bergson was writing and how he was sidelined so this kind of a sidelining continued till 1960s uh, this kind of a thing was resurrected bergson studies were resurrected only with the small monograph that deleuze had written in 1966 
Now here, Eliot questions the lack of scientific rigor in uh, Bergson's philosophy and compares it to lyric philosophies. Eliot's early disdain for philosophy stems from its perceived inability to define the ordinary experience in the world. So basically, uh, Eliot became a poet. First, he got really disillusioned with uh, philosophy. Then he had a very scientific temper. And eventually, he resorted towards uh, poetry because he wanted to figure out uh, which art or which way of thinking can come most close to this encounter of the ordinary experience. How can we really grasp something which is so much there as part of our consciousness? So that's the trajectory that he was following. And then uh, Eliot's disenchantment with Bergson arose from the persistence of divide that he felt in his most Bergsonian poem, which is Rhapsody on, the, on a Windy Night. This poem was written in 1912 and it was published in 1915, just after he returned to Harvard. On his return to Harvard, Eliot attended a seminar on Kant, which properly convinced him that he, the dualism that Bergson tried to solve by disentangling time from space is actually embedded in the human condition and as such remains irreducible. So it, it becomes a part of human condition that this dualism has to sustain. Nobody can really move beyond that including Bergson. So Eliot's, uh, Eliot felt that Bergson's philosophical outlook is a weaker version of idealism, where the qualitative aspect that defines duration also incorporates an element of number and so partakes in spatiality because uh, Bergson's duration also has this component which is extensive becoming and extensiveness is basically a measurement. And he tries to link these two ideas, not properly, but in a very superficial manner, Eliot, uh, as a weaker version of idealism. The kind of vocabulary which exists to define duration itself partakes in the measurement. So this was the problem of vocabulary and not so much of the problem with Bergson's philosophy. So the idea of duration is something which cannot be properly recognized because there is no vocabulary which can really deal with such uh, you know, ideas which are so much in flux, which are always changing. So now moving to the next part, which is Eliot's theology. And finally, by the time he returned to Harvard, he claimed to his brother, Henry, that uh, <clears throat> his initial seduction towards Bergson was largely based on a religious preoccupation. Okay, so that's a claim that he makes in his work, uh, which he wrote a book notebook, uh, which he sold in 1922. That notebook, which is now titled as Inventions of March Hare, was published just 20 years ago by Christopher Ricks in 1996. So from there, this whole idea emerges that Eliot declared that he his conversion to Bergson was actually a temporary, which is not true, because that appears in his poetry through and through. Now, Eliot's theology, however short-lived the duration of Bergson's influence on Eliot might have been, its impact seems to be everlasting. The blurring of past and present, which appears at the beginning of Burnt Norton, seems to suggest a step in the direction where Eliot's philosophy of time and his theological questions merge to the degree proposed by Bergson. And then there's this quote, which is basically from Burnt Norton, one of the poems that he has written, very important poems. Word moves, music moves, and it goes like that. Uh, in his assertion of coexistence, basically, th this poem is an assertion of coexistence, which is fundamentally a Bergsonian idea. Eliot is detailing his personal experience of turning to Christian faith in a world, what Mary Ann Gillies in a book, Henry Bergson and British Modernism calls a world without absolutes. So this relational process professed by Christian faith and Bergson's duty, la duty, appealed to Eliot because he was able to bring together the two seemingly incommensurable ideas of temporal and the timeless together. Okay, what is in the beginning is also in the end a point which was just uh, affirmed by Professor Frederick uh, in the first half of this conference. Now, moving to the next part. Okay, so this is a quote from Keith Ansel Pearson's book, Thinking Beyond the Human Condition. The lived experience in which diverse intuitions come into synthetic coexistence is the only way to affirm the concrete reality. And then this is the quote, for Bergson, the human is distinguished from the rest of the animal kingdom, not only as a rational animal, but also as the sick animal, because they are just not able to grasp the reality. So the quote goes like that. Eliot's theology is informed by this different kind and order in which humans are wedded to life, 
you know, drawing from this quote, where the finality of existence illuminates the point of beginning and simultaneously sheds light on the historical continuum. So Eliot proposed that the decadence which had pervaded the Western civilization actually served the function of ceremonial purgation and carries the vital impulse, which Bergson calls Elan Vital, the creative force which can lead to praxis or the politics of action or the politics of the actionable. Hence the need of dynamic religion over philosophy. You know, the dynamic religion is the open society, which is there in morality and uh, the, society, uh, the last book of Bergson. Uh, the Society of Morality and Religion. So unlike Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's work on genealogy of morality, professed of, who, who professed a philosophy of future from which new cultural parameters and a new generation of philosophers would emerge, Eliot actually looks for answers within the same decadent culture because he believes that there is some vital impulse which is still intact, which cannot be destroyed, even if the whole culture has been destroyed due to certain reasons. So Eliot, through his poem, The Hollow Men, also attempts to define a world which is shapeless, shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed pose, gesture without motion. The hollow men living in the dead land suffer from the crisis of subjectivity. And modernism is also in some ways an articulation of the crisis of subjectivity. This crisis ferments complete fragmentation and demands a new philosophy to affirm life in general. So this philosophy can arise from the method of intuition, which was suggested by Bergson, and not from the method of intellect. So which gazes at duration and expresses the organizing principles of our life, the continuity which exists. Now coming to the last part. Um, yeah. So Eliot's search and affirmation of the historical sense, which is there in his essay, Tradition and Individual Talent, one of the most important essays for modernist culture, which illuminates the work of an individual poet, the tradition which influences the poet and the poet who is influenced by the tradition and also influences the tradition. This is something which uh, is similar to Bergson's notion of becoming, which emerges from the totality of relationships where time is treated as an ontological force. So in creative evolution, Bergson articulates how human experience is informed by the movement of life, which takes into account both the actual and virtual multiplicities. So that's the point which is being referred over here. According to Bergson, the access to durational life and lived time emerges in the awareness where movement of life transforms itself into human experience and we impersonally experience it. So this idea of impersonality is also something which Eliot imbibes in his essay, Tradition and Individual Talent. So it is the durational life which connects the thinking being with the generative source or the germinal life uh, which exists. The disinterested mode of thought in which durational life is experienced is always getting introduced to the new. And that's the point which is mentioned over here in creative evolution. Uh, we do not think real time, but we live it because life transcends intellect. So this is the reversal that Bergson is going to talk about more in his works. And there's a sense of continuity which begins from time and free will and continues till his last work, uh, even till the creative mind, all his seven, eight works discuss the same idea again and again. So this radical remolding of philosophy of time, which is being suggested by Bergson, integrates novelty, something new which can emerge. This idea of new remains, even though modernism is seen as the period of fragmentation from which nothing can come. That's why Eliot's poem, one of the most important poems is The Wasteland. Uh, for Bergson, the principle of creation is achieved in reality with its advancing further. The creative novelty and the integrative continuity that Bergson describes is what informs Eliot's notion of tradition and individual talent as well. Similarly, Eliot's stance on theory of poetry can be traced to the unification of sensibility, another important idea that he discusses, where a fusion of thought and feeling takes place. For Eliot, this is essential for good poetry. This dynamism which exists between thought and feeling, between intellect and intuition, between tradition and individual, between objects and their correlates, pervades entire Eliot's corpus. Eliot's poems, uh, informed by his critical works, present a tableau of thought and feeling like the patient etherized on the table. One of the images that I'm drawing from his uh, early important uh, poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So Prufrock, Prufrock is unable to feel the fundamental split in his psyche with, between thought and feeling. However, this allows the poet to turn the inevitable alteration of feeling into art. For Eliot, the poetic principle emerges by revealing the unavoidable division of thought from feeling, the self-consciousness 
about language of poetry and prove Frog's self-consciousness about himself go hand in hand in the poem. And this is something which is claimed in the poem. No, uh, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was I meant to be. So I propose with these ideas that Eliot's creativity, his poetic principle, lies in his affirmation of coexistence of thought and feeling, which is based on Bergson's creative philosophy that novelty exists and it can be achieved uh, when reality advances further. So it is in this way uh, that both, books, both Eliot as well as Bergson come very close to this idea of coexistence. Now the last part, which is conclusion, so finally, through a careful exposition of Eliot's works, I have tried to substantiate two premises on which this presentation is based. One, or first, Eliot's philosophy cannot be believed to be limited to the early stages of his life. All right, That is something which has been one of the most um, important perspective in Eliot's uh, Eliot's, uh, you know, scholarship, so to speak, like people who are working on Eliot, they have always reduced, they have always tried to compartmentalize his, uh, you know, poetic experience uh, in a very different way from his philosophical experience. And I'm trying to bridge that gap. I'm trying to move beyond that idea. So Eliot's philosophy is far closely intertwined with his poetic works, effectively turning him into a philosopher poet. So that's something which I'm trying to look at. Secondly, and most importantly, Eliot's conversion to Bergson was not a temporary one. It was not. And once he was admitted, it, which he once admitted to be the case, Eliot in his dissertation, Poetry and Prose, raised questions which are fiercely Bergsonian and looked to different ideas coming from philosophy, religion, and even science to arrive at some possible answers. Okay. Yes, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Mohit. Um, okay, if you have any questions, anyone that still has questions, of course, just put them in the chat and I will add you to the queue. Um, our first question is from uh, Hisashi uh, Fujita. So Hisashi, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes you. Okay, uh, thank you for Joel and uh, Mohit. Uh, both papers are excellent. And uh, I have a question uh, for Joel. Um, actually, um, this question of panpsychism is, uh, uh, I think, uh, one of the hot topics in analytical philosophy, uh, more precisely in analytical metaphysics, and uh, therefore uh, one of the possibilities of uh, connecting uh, Bergsonian studies and uh, analytical approach. Uh, my question concerns the distinction uh, between the uh, panpsychism and uh, what Herbert Feigl calls in uh, 1960 uh, panqualitism. Actually, uh, this uh, uh, my my question is based on uh, Yasushi Hirai's uh, paper uh, on panqualitism. Uh, so perhaps I think uh, Yasushi has uh, many questions after me. And uh, so my question is very elementary. Um, so uh, punk, uh, psychism has actually two problems. Uh, first, uh, how to consider the existence of the subject uh, which has uh, this experience of uh, uh, consciousness, uh, this uh, the problem of mind. And the second, uh, the uh, problem is the uh, uh, the problem of order, uh, how we can uh, combine a small uh, micro uh, experience to a huge uh, 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 macro uh, experience. So the, the, the question of uh, combination of uh, uh, small parts of, uh, uh, how to say, uh, so this experience of uh, uh, psyche. So uh, how uh, can you, uh, uh, so, uh, how you do you uh, think uh, think uh, of, about this uh, distinction between the panpsychism and the pan qualitism? Thank you. Okay, thanks for your question, Zashi. Um, yeah. As regards your, your first question, I think is easier than the second one. Uh, um, my uh, Bergson's uh, uh, 
uh, answer to your first question is that uh, uh, matter uh, is uh, a set of images. So uh, a computer problem, sorry. Uh, so um, uh, for Bergson, uh, matter is a set of images. So uh, Bergson supports, clearly supports a kind, a kind of pan qualitivism. I think it's a word used, pan qualitivism. Um, as regards James, I think you, if you consider uh, the James's, the, 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 the Jamesian uh, theory of pure experience, you have some something similar, but I don't know uh, enough chance to answer to this question. Um, so Bergson is clearly a pan quality, uh, clearly supports a pan a kind of pan quality pan qualitivism. Uh, as regards your second question, of course, it's a crucial question for uh, contemporary panpsychism, because in contemporary panpsychism. The, the crucial question is that of the origin of consciousness uh, from a not matter. But in fact, it is absolutely not <laughs> the question, the crucial question in Bergson. It's, it's clear and it's not the, the, the main question in James. James raises this question, but it's not his main question. Uh, uh, once again, the, 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 are, the are crucial question for Bergson and James is that of causation. And um, uh, as regards to the composition of uh, consciousness, Bergson is clearly opposed to this idea. Because for Bergson, consciousness, uh, our consciousness comes from life and life is as old as earth matter. This is what he says in creative evolution. This position is absolutely not um, uh, um, uh, acceptable today, but it is his position in creative evolution. Uh, he, he thinks that the, the, the first form of life could be gaseous in the, in the first nebulas. Uh, so um, uh, for Bergson, um, the, 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 the answer is clearly, uh, there is no composition of our consciousness. Um, and for, for James, the question is more complicated. James is opposed to this idea first in the principles of psychology and in, in his last book, uh, in fact, he, he seems to support this idea without uh, explaining, without uh, giving a lot of explanations, just a, a little, but he, he, for different requirements, he thinks that we must define a kind of theory of the composition of consciousness. Um, you also ask a question about, your first question was about, there was a, a third question about, uh, Panpsychism and subjectivity. Okay, um, I, I think it's um, you, you can answer to this question with Bergson uh, saying that um, uh, speaking of a subject is speaking of a being having a memory and an ability to retrieve all his past memories. But matter has not this ability. So matter has mental properties, but it is not a subject. It can be, it can seem uh, paradoxical, but for Bergson, you can have mentality without subjectivity. And even you can have mentality without life. It, it, I know it's very paradoxical, but for, for Bergson, the, concept, the, 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 the domain of life is, um, uh, uh, um, is, is, is less wide than the domain of mentality. Uh, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, Rob, uh, you're up next. All right, well, uh, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Mohit, for your papers. They're both uh, enthralling. Um, and so we heard a bit of this in Mohit's mention of philosophy of action, but I wanted to hear what, if any, you know, corollary implications for morality and ethics your, uh, your work on this actually might have. Um, because in the last three or four pages of the two sources of morality and religion, uh, Bergson talks about the negotiation of, of philosophy and science, specifically physics, as a way of life. He also, this is tangentially related to panpsychism, he also talks about the legitimacy of telepathic uh, phenomena. Um, 
And lastly, he talks about science's inability to establish the impossibility of a fact, which I know your other work has also talked about, Joel. So, um, and all of this is really just talking, this is all ex exhorting a particular kind of way of life. So I was wondering if you really, if either of you have found yourself thinking about what some moral implications of, of Bergsonian philosophy's negotiation with essentially science and also analytic philosophy might be. Thanks. Your question is for, for both, both of us. Both of us, yeah. Should I go first? All right. Okay, so one of the implications that I see of Bergson's philosophy, the moral framework, is uh, in the post-capitalist age, where we have this uh, consumerism, this uh, consumerist capitalism, which is going on. And now we are living in a world of networked economy that everybody has to be logged in all the time. So it is in some ways colonizing even those moments like even if you're sleeping, at least your profile should remain logged in. You know, that's the kind of capitalism that we are having right now. So the idea where I see the politics of action, which can really emerge is in uh, the schema, the reverse, ir the reversible schema that uh, Bergson provides in the form of a virtual, which exists, all right? So because it is reversible, it is something which cannot be appropriated by capital. So. What I'm trying to suggest is that Deleuze also tries to talk about that we need to move to this micro category. We need to have micro politics, right? So over there, I'm seeing that if we have this zone, which is being colonized, which is being appropriated by capitalism, there are certain zones, which I would call zones of uh, counterintuition or zones which cannot really be appropriated by capital, where action can emerge. Because capitalism has this kind of a tendency which that it can anticipate any kind of a reaction to itself. And it has a, a tendency to appropriate everything. So these zones cannot be, cannot be anticipated, neither can it be appropriated because these zones are not real. These zones exist at the virtual level. So that's something where I think Bergson's philosophy of time can make a contribution in uh, providing certain zones of resistance to the post-capitalist age that we live in. Um, sorry, can you can you repeat your question, please? It was about uh, an, an, an analytic uh, philo analytic philosophy, analytic uh, attitude. Uh, I actually. I threw that in just uh, sort of in response to Hisashi's question as well. But um, I was just thinking about the fact, specifically in your work, Joel, uh, of of Bergson's philosophy and its negotiation um, with science um, and how in, uh, uh, in Le Deux Source, um, Bergson, he, he really, like the final pages, he uh, talks about these as two competing ways of life. And this is all within the context of um, his exhortation for an open society and dynamic religion. I was just wondering if you, uh, if there were any sort of uh, ethical or moral thoughts uh, or implications that you felt that your own work had, but, um, but you know, if, the, <laughs> yeah, um, if not, absolutely. Yeah, there is an implication, <laughs> there are implications. Uh, okay, um, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, at first sight, we, we can think that there is no implication between uh, this, uh, the, 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 this very technical uh, question of metaphysics uh, in uh, an analytic uh, form and uh, moral and, and political implications. Uh, the, the, the duration, uh, the implications are absolutely not immediate, of course. But I think that um, uh, the, there are implications, uh, but it, 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 I, I, don't, I don't know if it, if it is a Bergsonian opinion or just my opinion, but in my opinion, uh, I think that um, uh, even if uh, metaphysics uh, is, a, um, is, a, a, is a discipline um, uh, who, is who is interesting for very few people, I think that uh, the metaphysical ideas uh, in a society uh, uh, progressively um, uh, have an influence on uh, all the country. So. Um, I, I think that uh, even if this, this debate about panpsychism, which is a very uh, uh, um, um, current debate today, even if this debate is very technical, 
I think, in fact, that uh, it, uh, in a way or another, I, I, I can't know, in a way or another, uh, 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 will, will have implications uh, uh, in the society. But well, far, from, far from action, of I, course, far from action. <laughs> I would like to add one more point. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. OK, so there's, yeah, yeah. So there's one more moral implication that I see which can emerge from books on, which is uh, because of the age of Anthropocene, which is upon us, the point which was mentioned by Professor Frederick also, right? So over there also, this idea of like uh, Bernard Stiegler, who just passed away a month ago, uh, he was working extensively on, uh, you know, uh, not exactly on Bergson, but uh, on uh, Gilbert Simondon's idea of individuation. So one moral implication can be that what should be our moral response to understanding not only our problems or our human condition, but also the problems of the non-human or at a planetary level, what should be the moral courage that we should be having? Because Anthropocene has provided us like Anthropocene has made us reach this point where there is this dithering which is happening, a very indecisiveness, where you would actually see in America also, but that kind of a thing exists, I think, everywhere, where some people believe that climate change is really happening and some people say that it's just a hoax. So if you're living in such divided times, where will the moral courage come from? And is that moral courage supposed to be limited only to the human condition or something far beyond that? So this implication can come very strongly from Bergson's philosophy. Because in the affirmation of Elan Vital, that this vital impulse is not something which is there only in humans. It's something which is there even in bacteria and genomes. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, wonderful. Okay, the next question is from Tano Passero. So Tano, you can go ahead. Thanks, Ted. Um, thanks, both of you, for the papers. Uh, it's a question for Joel, again, about uh, panpsychism, uh, mostly a clarificatory question. Um, thinking about a particular um, material mentality or the mindedness of matter, um, I feel like it's important to, to note the distinction in Bergson between matter images of determinate material bodies or individual material things, which are, of course, only images for living beings that reflect living beings' virtual action on them, and matter itself, which is pure undivided flux, not individuated, not made up of bodies at all. So it's quite weird to hear a discussion or reflection on whether matter could be minded for Bergson or conscious, because independently of the way living beings act uh, and so make images of matter, we're talking about an undivided material whole, right? So a consciousness in that sense, not the consciousness or the, or the mentality of individual material bodies the way panpsychists typ typically talk about it, right? Wondering whether, say, the chair has a kind of mindedness about it or something like that. Um, the chair is only an image for me, a living being that can act on it. So it wouldn't make any sense to ask whether that image has a mindedness. Um, so that's, uh, there are some questions sort of in there, but I want to note that distinction between the material whole and specific matter images. Um, it seems important, it seems crucial, in fact, to a discussion of panpsychism in Bergson, and then to ask you, Joel, whether you are attributing consciousness to the undivided material whole in Bergson and what that would look like, since again, it's, it's not individuated, it, it isn't divided, and it's only living beings and their actions that introduce divisions uh, into matter. Thanks. Okay, thanks for your uh, question. Very interesting question, in fact. Um, in contemporary panpsychism, you have uh, two uh, great options. Huh? Uh, the, the two options you mentioned. Uh, uh, the first one is called is, is often called micropsychism, and the second one, uh, cosmopsychism. Uh, mentality um, for the first one, mentality uh, belongs to uh, the elementary particles, to elementary uh, uh, things. And uh, for the second one, mentality uh, uh, belongs to uh, uh, the, the universe as a whole. Uh, and um, I think that in my presentation, I, 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 don't, I, I didn't say uh, something about uh, this point for Bergson, uh, nor for James, uh, because in fact, it's a technical point, a question, 
that uh, uh, if, in fact, the, um, uh, uh, maybe there are elements in uh, in both uh, Bergson and James. In in Bergson, uh, of course, uh, uh, Bergson uh, uh, said that the matter is not a set of elementary uh, things perfectly distinct. But if you read carefully the fourth uh, thesis thesis in chapter four of matter memory, uh, Bergson uh, doesn't write that uh, there is absolutely no uh, distinction, no no discontinuity in matter. Is he, he said that this discontinuity is not absolute. And in other passage in chapter one, he, he, he speaks of material points. So uh, even if there are passages in which he speaks of matter as a uh, totality, in other passage, he speaks of matter as more or less divided. So. If you ask me the question, is Bergson uh, a micro a psychist or a cosmopsychist? Uh, my answer is, I don't think so. Maybe he, 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 he would uh, think that the two, um, the two ideas are interesting. And in fact, I think I, I, I know, um, I haven't, um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know James, uh, uh, um, as Bergson, but I think in James you have the same answer. Uh, in particular, in his last book, The Pluralistic Universe, uh, uh, James, uh, because James in this book uh, uh, did uh, uh, supports a kind of theory of the composition of consciousness, but at different, uh, at, at several uh, levels. Uh, it seemed that he considered that there is a kind of consciousness at a very um, a microphysical level and at the level of the universe as a whole with different intermediary levels. So I would say that James is, probab is uh, probably also a micropsychist and a cosmopsychist. <laughs> I don't know if my uh, answer is, uh, is um, uh, complete, but... Uh... All right, we have time for about one more question and this one goes to Yasuji Harai. Okay, <clears throat> hello. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for all. Thank you very much for uh, excellent presentations. And I have a question to uh, Joel. And uh, as 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 uh, mentioned earlier by Fujita, I, I I have also the same interest as, as you. And uh, I have I, I have written a paper about the uh, qualities of Bergson. And I have a, I have a two quick, two short questions. So one, the first one is about you. You said uh, th this is not a question about uh, the origin of consciousness, but the the question of in the causality. So could you elaborate why you think so? And uh, so is is there any specific reason to 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 affirm that point? And the second point is uh, the second question is about uh, what you you have distinguished two types of arguments about his, uh, Bergson's panpsychism. That one, the first one is about memory of immediate past, and the second one is memory of uh, motor memory. And uh, yeah, as long as I understood uh, you, uh, in conclusion, you you. You you uh, you have meant to support his idea about the the, the question is uh, the how to explain the regularity in the natural world, and uh, to explain that Bergson affirms the the those those arguments. But as long as I, I understood the the second argument, on only the second argument is used to support the regularity of material world that is motor memory so uh this, the first one ha, does, does any uh that does it have any role in the in your argument to support the the conclusion that this is the second question okay, okay. thanks for uh, uh for your two questions uh, Yazushi. um as regards the, the first question, my, my answer uh, uh, will be simple. I uh, I think that if you take all the passages 
uh, about uh, all the passages expressing uh, Pamsaike Saida's endorsement, I think that they are all about uh, change, causation, etc. But you have no no passage about the question of the, of the origin of consciousness. So it's a strong difference from contemporary Pamsaikism. And in fact, I, I, I would say that Bergson uh, uh, does not say that uh, uh, our consciousness um, uh, has not matter, as, as, uh, 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 is not originated in matter. But uh, what he says in, uh, in Creative Evolution is uh, clearly enough to know that uh, he, 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 do, he doesn't support a theory of the composition of consciousness. I mean, his position about the origin of consciousness and life in, in creative evolution is absolutely clear. Mm. So uh, there is no ambiguity in Bergson. In James, it's more complicated. And in fact, uh, 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 in his last book, James supports a theory of the, of the composition of consciousness by, uh, on the base of uh, 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 elementary uh, uh, um, um, particles, elementary atoms. Um, so uh, uh, the, the, in Bergson, it is very clear. In James, uh, once again, the question is more complicated. Uh, as regards your, uh, your second question, uh, in my opinion, uh, it is what I said, the second argument, the, uh, the second Bergson's argument uh, is better, is more interesting uh, than the first, uh, because it is based on uh, empirically obvious premises. But in fact, uh, um, uh, if you consider all the passages about Tamsai Kevin Bergson, uh, I, I, I don't think that you will be able to, to, um, to um, uh, explain uh, all these passages only with uh, the idea that matter has a motor memory. You must uh, uh, it, it's, it's strange for me too, but you must uh, 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 see that Bergson says two things. Uh, in fact, Berg, in my opinion, Bergson distinguishes uh, at all four kinds of memory. Memory par excellence, memory contraction. These two memories are uh, the memories of living beings and human beings and memory of the immediate past and motor memory and matter has only these two memories. And in particular, uh, uh, the, 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 there is a long passage in duration and simultaneity, in, in duration and simultaneity where uh, Bergson said that matter has a memory, but it is not a motor memory. You can't uh, find the concept of motor memory in this passage. So it's Bergson. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, since he's our host, I'm going to give one last question to Len, uh, who has something lined up. Len, you can go ahead. So thank, <clears throat> thank you both for your papers. I really found them very stimulating. But um, Mohit, I have a question for you. It's kind of general, but um, my knowledge of Eliot uh, is pretty pretty uh, small. Um, but you mentioned his theology. I just was wondering whether you could elaborate in a short way about his theology, because to the context for my question is, um, and maybe other Bergson scholars would disagree with me here, but um, but Bergson's theology seems to me to be quite obscure uh, because it's easy to think that Bergson's concept of God is imminent to the to duration or the Elan Vital, but then there are these letters and uh, his his conversations with Chevalier at the publication of uh, the two sources where Bergson insists that God is transcendent. And it's really hard for me to reconcile what seems implied in creative evolution and the two sources. And then these comments, um, somewhat private comments he makes in the controversy following the publication of the two sources. And I don't know whether Eliot would have read the two sources, but he certainly would have read creative evolution, I, I imagine, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, yeah. God's mentioned in, in chapter three there. But again, just yes, the, the short version of my question is just to elaborate on whether God is transcendent or imminent in Eliot, mm -hmm. or do you have a sense of what, what he would have said? Okay, okay. Yeah, so it is in 1927 that he turned to Anglicanism because uh, he was very disillusioned with this idea that he was not able to make sense of what is happening in the aftermath of 
uh, World War One. So for Eliot, because he is not just referring to Bergson's philosophy, there is another aspect of Eliot's theology, which is reference to Buddhism, which I could not mention because of the time constraints. Over there also, there is this dissolution of time which takes place, which is not saying uh, that time does not exist, but it basically means that the beginning and the end is something which dissolves in the present. So that kind of a continuity emerges. So just like Bergson, Einstein, uh, Eliot also affirmed this imminence. Everything is there already. So there is no transcendence which is there in Eliot's corpus after 1922. There could have been this kind of a corollary. There could have been this kind of a contradiction in the early works of uh, Eliot, which was written from 1915 to 1920s. But by the time he had converted himself to Anglican faith, after that, there is complete uh, certainty in his works, which is that everything is imminent. There is this plane of imminence and time has to dissolve. So his later works, not only his poetry, but also very significantly his plays, Murder in the Cathedral, also discusses this idea very strongly about the plane of imminence. So transcendence then just disappears after his uh, conversion to Anglicanism in 1927.